Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. And I've been told, I know I have this habit of rolling up my sleeves because I can't stand long sleeve shirts. I've also been told that if they're not even, they really bug some people. Yeah, I gotta go. I gotta get up above my elbow. And so, since it is, it bothers people. I'm just gonna do it like this. <laughs> now, don't be any. I'm not gonna do that. I can't stand it. But uh, in Genesis 22, you know, some there's some passages in the Bible that are easier to teach than others. It's just um, there's more more in some passages less in others and there's more going on and some of the times especially in some of the Old Testament narratives there's just a lot that, that, that is rehashed the Hebrews do that on purpose uh, they say the same thing over and over and over and over again uh, <clears throat> usually because we're a little thick some of us but we're coming off I want, to, I want you to really try to put yourself in Abraham's place today because he's, he's a you're really about to read about how much he's gone through, uh, he's going to go through as we read today, what he's just come off of, and uh, we'll find that he's in a situation I think many times we all find ourselves. Um, I don't know how many of you remember, but when I was a kid, <clears throat> probably, I don't know, maybe during the, the summertime or whatever, we'd get a... Sears, use the back of Sears and Roebuck catalog back then, or Sears and Rareback, Daddy would say. Um, and, you know, they would, way back in the day, you used them in the outhouse, not the colored pages, because they were too <laughs> slick. But the, the, they had the ones in the back that were kind of like a, like a phone book. But they would come out, and it'd be a wish book. Sometimes it was a separate one, sometimes just one section, and it was full of, of course, toys. And we would get this, and I can remember, man, we would just tear it up, just looking through. It had all this different kind of stuff. And for months and months, you think about, oh, this is what I want. I want. Of course, as a kid, you want everything you can get your hands on. <clears throat> but that wish book would come out every year, a few months before Christmas. And Sears knew what they were doing because now you had several months to pester your parents and to try to... to, to you know, get as much stuff as you could. Another thing is uh, we would use the old ones. If you stack them on top of each other, they make good booster chairs for the kids. Um, but, I mean, they were just multi-purpose books, I guess you would say that way. <clears throat> but I could always find something that I felt I just had to have. <clears throat> no matter how silly it was to anyone else, in my mind, it was something I felt like I just had to have. And I, every year I would find at least one good thing that I would have been willing to sell my sister for uh, in order to get what I, I wanted. Now, I give you this illustration not just of, one, of someone wanting something so badly that they would do anything to get it. But it is, however, an illustration of how we hang on to a dream and then attempt to convince others that we are on the right track in pursuit of that dream. And today we're going to see that Abraham has spent the majority of his adult life in pursuit of a promise. And as we now read, he's in the latter years of his life. Uh, as he approached the end of his life, he still didn't really have much of anything tangible to show for the pursuit of his dream. Last, uh, last time I was here, Pastor Stu's been teaching the last week or two. I had to go out of town last week. But last week we ended with God halting Abraham when he was about to sacrifice his only son Isaac. God said, stop. And there's a lot of symbolism there. And as, as well as the next few chapters, a lot of symbolism there also. But it's going to be important to see not only what was said, but what is not said. What's kind of left in between the lines. And you can imagine for, for Abraham... You know, he's sweating this out, all the build-up going up. To, he's walking, you know, he and the other guys, and his son is there. And they're talking, and, and Abraham just trying to pull this thing off. You know, just, hey, son, how about the, you know, how about the Braves? Yeah, they're horrible again this year. Yeah, and, but one day, you know, when God comes back, maybe they'll be good again. 
um, you know, that sort of stuff as they're they're just shooting the breeze because that's what guys do. They do small talk when they don't really want to talk about anything important, which is a lot of the time, a lot of the time. So he's got all this going on, and then finally he gets up there. Abraham's like, I mean, excuse me, uh, Isaac is well, father. Where's the where's the sacrifice? Oh, don't worry about that. We got it. God's got it covered. Goes through all this, and then finally God stops him. And for the first time I can imagine in a long time, Abraham's able to go, what a roller coaster. And it must have been a relief in many ways for Abraham to hear God and and have his son spared. God, of course, provides the ram in the thicket, and that is way more than in that uh, ancient uh, culture goes a lot deeper than you might think. And then God reiterates his promises to Abraham. Genesis 22, chapter, uh, verse 15 says, Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, emphasis there, Blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And we, begin, we need to begin to look at the symbolism that is beginning to, to sh- take shape here. I want you to notice the recurrence of the, the phrase, your son, your only son. And this should sound familiar, familiar to you because in John three sixteen we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And it not only gives us the foundation for the symbolism that we'll see, but it also once again rules out Ishmael as the son of promise. Now there, of course, is the the Muslim faith believes that uh, uh, Ishmael is the son of promise. They need to explain somehow how um, their account is nearly... 2,000 years younger than the original. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be a problem for some people. But we need to see how Abraham, the father in this case, is going to sacrifice his only son for the plan of God. And we also need to remember, as we talked about it last week, or the, a couple of weeks ago, that Isaac had to be obedient in this also because he is not a kid at this time. He is a strapping young man and though Abraham has been uh, rejuvenated in probably many ways, um, he's, well, the New Testament says he was almost dead in a sense. He's been, his, his, all his, he's running on eight cylinders again, let's just put it that way. Um, that Ab- uh, Isaac is still probably most capable of taking the old man. Uh, so Abraham, uh, Isaac has to be obedient in this also. Jesus was obedient in going to the cross for us. He did ask for a way out. Father, if there's any way this cup could pass from me. He asked that a couple of times. And then finally comes, he just makes a circle and says, Nevertheless, thy will be done. So he succumbed to the will of his father. We read about that in Matthew 26. It says, He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed. And remember, at the time he's praying this, he's got droplets of blood, the capillaries, and I forget the medical term for it. It's about this long. But the capillaries, or the, the blood is actually being forced through the capillaries to his skin because his blood pressure has gone up uh, extensively. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Verse 42, again a second time he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. So as we go through the next several chapters, I want you to see the ways in which Isaac fits as a type of Jesus. Abraham is then promised that his seed will number as the stars of the heavens and the sands of the sea. He's promised that his descendants will possess the gates of their enemies. And then in verse 18, we see that the whole earth will be blessed because he, one man, uh, well... Sarah's in this too, obeyed uh, the voice of God. And we need to think about that for a little while because our obedience, as does our disobedience, 
affects others. Not only in our immediate sphere of influence, but also for years to come. If you are a young husband, father, mother, wife, decisions you make right now will affect those children for years and years and years to come. In all the counseling I've done, when children seem to go off the rails, if you will study the, the, I hate to use their term, the psychology, though, of spree killers, serial killers, you can almost always go back to the time that they were a child when something happened in that house, whether it's some sort of abuse or, dare I say, divorce. Something happened that so damaged those children that it just, they're messed up as a football bat for the rest of their lives. You know, that's bad. But the point I want to drive home is the decisions we make, especially when we don't make them in the interest of our children, in the interest of those with whom we work, in the interest of those with whom we go to church, in the interest of uh, those in our family, when we make them for selfish reasons because I'm just not happy. It sends ripple effects that damage not only us individually because, you know, there's not a lot of difference a lot of times between adults and children when we see something we like. You know, adults can get into that wish book too. And the danger is we got credit cards. And you can just online and, and there it goes. And all of a sudden we get bills coming in that we may or may not be able to pay. So then you start paying a minimum balance, which really is just, uh, you know, kicking the can down the road. But we get in that wish book too. And it's always because, as the Bible says, there's nothing in this world but the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, i got to have it. And the pride of life, it makes me feel better. It makes me feel smarter. Me, me, me. And though everything we hear today is about your self-esteem, I'm here to tell you that according to the Bible, your problem is yourself, not your esteem. When you esteem yourself, you run into issues. So when everybody starts talking about your self-esteem, won't you understand, self is the problem. Self-esteem can be very dangerous. But because we now live in a culture that is so inwardly focused on us and what we want and instant gratification, now self-esteem seems to be the, the foundation for, for our lives when it's not supposed to be. Humility is supposed to be the foundation for our lives uh, based upon the Word of God and our place in that world, our standing before God and knowing how we really are. If you really know if you're honest and, and repentant, then you know your state before God. And guess what? Self-esteem kind of goes... It goes by the wayside. Well, then well, that means we're supposed to go around like this all the time. No, 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 not at all. Because though I know what I am, I also look around and say, my daddy owns all this. And someday I get to inherit it. And then whatever issues I may have, he has given me the, the empowerment or he enables me to overcome those things. But if I ever get to this point of self-pity and woe is me and look at this ride I'm on and, and I, joined Christ, you know, I joined up with the church or I became a Christian because I want my total life to be you know, groovy, that's not happening. You know, you can, like Simon Garfunkel says, you can be feeling groovy. Well, that happened. that's okay for a little while, but I promise you, you're not going to feel groovy all the time. And as we look at Abraham and Sarah, they don't feel groovy all the time. Look at, just, um, just look at their lives and what they've gone through. But at the same time, even though as we've been going through their lives and we see that there's this, you know, you see there's this roller coaster there's good times, bad times. That's a Zeppelin too. Uh, as you see, even though you got that going up and down, when it comes in the New Testament, when uh, there's a, an appraisal given of their lives, you see it's this. And we can read that and go, oh my goodness, well they were perfect. 
<laughs> no, read the Old Testament. They weren't perfect by any means. And you know what that tells me? I'm glad they weren't perfect. Well, they're not being selfish. No, that just puts me in the same boat with them as not being perfect. But their lives, their decisions have, it, have affected going back to a, a family that really has no, they don't own a house. They're Bedouins. In this little bitty country that's a speck on a map, in one couple, couple, not just one couple, um, the decisions they made in the obedience to God, now you, all you got to do is flip on the news and you see how it has affected everyone. Do you realize they've affected your lives because you wouldn't be sitting here right now? You wouldn't be sitting in a church. You wouldn't be part of a, of a universal body, the body of Christ, if it was not for their obedience. And we can't ever go wrong by obeying God, but it does result in hard choices. But the end result is always for the better. And so when we're going through life, and this is hard, and I don't do this, and it's easier, it's easier to lay in bed on Sunday morning. I get it. It's easier to lay in bed or, or to come home and be tired and not go to Bible study. It's easier to do a lot of things. But do you really want to be like water, which always takes a path that leaves resistance? Is that what we want to be? Or do we want to be someone that stands up upon our convictions and our worldview? So we can never go wrong by obeying God. And now Abraham has done this hard thing and he's come out of it. Is it? Has he gone through traumatic experiences that could possibly wound his inner child? Yes. That's life. Get over it. No need. He didn't stop by the pharmacy on the way back and get happy pills to cope or anything like that. You know why? Because he knows he's in the will of God, in the will of God by doing this. He knows that the hard decisions he's making, he knows that his entire life is, is, is based on doing or not doing the will of God. Now, that puts a totally different perspective on everything we do. If it's about you enjoying climbing the ladder, whatever you want to do, and I hope you climb it, make sure you pay your tithe. But, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I want you to have success. But... If you get up in the morning and that success is what you're thinking about straight out of the gate, then you've got your priorities wrong. If we get up in the morning and it is, what is the will of God for me today? Then that supersedes anything that goes on at work, but I promise you it will take you through whatever you're going through at work. And then every... Um, confrontation or challenge, thank you, that you go through during that day at work becomes an opportunity instead of an obstacle. You know, back two or 3,000 years ago, um, when people uh, would get to the coastline of Europe or Asia or what have you, or even in the Americas, um, some people would see the ocean as an obstacle. That's because they didn't know how to make a boat. But if you have a boat, it's not an obstacle. It's a freeway. It's a way to cross the entire planet. So it's what it seems to be an obstacle to some is an opportunity or a means by which we can do something for the kingdom of God. If in the every morning is, Lord, thy will be done. So Abraham comes off the mountain. The boy is spared. They've sacrificed the ram. He comes back down, and I know he's like, Phew. I don't have to explain this to the guys now that I lost him on top of the mountain. And in verse 19, we see that he returns to the men. It says, So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Notice that after the sacrifice, there's no mention of Isaac. You won't read about him for a long time. In fact, you won't hear of, a, hear, hear of him again until he rides out to take his bride. Now remember how I told you to look for symbolism? Now, you can't build all of your theology off of this by any means. But you, do, you can recognize the patterns. 
Jewish literature of the time states that Isaac went to study, and remember they're on Mount Moriah, uh, which uh, is in my humble but correct opinion is not where the Temple Mount is considered to be today, but it's in the city of David where the Bible says it is, which is just about 600 uh, feet or so south of there. But he's in the city of David, and if the typology holds up, then he's actually being sacrificed in what would eventually become the city of David. But it's the ancient city of Jebus, Jebus Salem, or eventually we come up with the name Jerusalem. But Jewish literature of the time states that Isaac was sent to study in there, or left to study in Jerusalem with Melchizedek, whom they say is Shem and Eber, and that he was schooled there. Uh, so that he is able to know all that God would have for him. Genesis 22, verses 20 through 24 says, Now it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Indeed, Milcah has also borne children to your brother Nahor. Now this is, you're like, what in the world? Who put this in there? This has got to be what we'd call parenthetical, a kind of parenthesis. Somebody just stuck that in there, just we've got to put it somewhere, put it in there. But the Hebrews didn't write, they don't put things in there for no reason. Everything's in there for, every yacht and tittle is in there for a reason. Indeed, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor. Huz, his firstborn. Buzz, his brother. Almost like they're twins, maybe. You know, Huz and Buzz. Kemuel, the father of Aram. Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begot Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abram's, Abraham's brother, his concubine, whose name was Reomah, also bore Teba, Gehom, Thahas, and Machachach, or something. You know, Micah, well, Malcolm, we'll call him that. So these verses set the stage for chapter 24, where Abraham tells his servant to go get a bride for Isaac from amongst his kinfolk. And these verses aren't just arbitrarily placed here. Once again, I want you to understand what's going on here because the enemy does play. You, you will get a word from the enemy sometimes. I don't mean don't, go, don't get over-spiritualized. I'm just talking about something's going to come and knock you down. All right? The thing about this, he's been traumatized, Abraham has for a while. He's almost had to kill his son as a sacrifice to God. He was then spared from that, and then he has God's promises reiterated to him. In verse 12, he once again had gotten God's approval for the faith he had shown. Abraham has also seen, uh, had also seen this entire episode as an opportunity to worship. In verse 5, he says, we're going to worship. How is killing my son worship? How is something that's hard worship? Because if you think worship is standing and raising your hand and singing, you got another thing coming. It's part of it. But getting your praise on, that's not really worship. You understand? Worship is actually defined as bending or yielding to the will of God. That is worship, and therefore that's what he was doing. So singing is great. Raising your hands, clapping, all those things are great, they're awesome. But if, you, if, you, if your worship is relegated to that first 20, 30 minutes or whatever of the service, then you've got relationship issues with the Lord. Because yielding, bending to His will is actually the truest form of worship. How many of us can say we take such stressful predicaments especially as Abraham having to sacrifice his son. How many of us can, we, can say we take such stressful predicaments, challenges, obstacles, what have you, as an opportunity to worship? Now, do you see how the, that changes your perspective on things? It's actually in front of me. Therefore, I know that if God is leading me, that has been placed there for some reason. Or maybe it's because we did something stupid. And we turn left when you should have, you know, you jihad when you should have, uh, uh, jihad, what's the other one? Haw. G and haw, I'm sorry. We I mean, g when we should have, g is to the right, haw is to the left. We hawed when we should have g I remember that much. Um, we took the wrong turn and now we've done something stupid and now there's something in front of us. 
Well, part is it our fault? <laughs> kind of. Has God put something in front of us? Yeah, kind of. You'll never get those two cores un, in, untwined because you, if you are in the body of Christ, your will, even though it's wrong for most of us a lot of times, is now wrapped with God's. You'll never peel those two apart no matter how hard you try. If you're a child of God, when you haul instead of G, then all of a sudden there is God again. So that's the way I take it. There's something in front of me, and, and can I see it as an opportunity or is it an obstacle? Can I, you know, some people say money is a tool. Well, the problem is I never had any tools. <laughs> you know, to me it's an obstacle, uh, uh, the lack thereof. Or technology is an awesome tool, but it doesn't work for me most of the time. So it's an obstacle. But I know if I have the right people in place, it becomes a great tool that I can use if I can just get past my own ignorance of it. But how many of us can say we take such stressful predicaments as especially none of us have been put through what Abraham's been run through. Uh, how many of us can say we take such predicaments as an opportunity to worship? Remember, once again, it's not just singing. It is, as Pastor Michael, as Pastor Malcolm Wilde would put it, worship is submitting ourselves to the will of God and once again, that's the most pure definition of the word. We would say, if we're looking once again over the course of Abraham's life, we can easily say that he's been on a roller coaster of sorts. He had to send Ishmael, his, his son, away with bread and water. That's not going to win you any points with anyone. You know, nowadays, the government will swoop in and, and you know, take them away from you. He then had to take Isaac to a mountain to potentially sacrifice him. And then at the appointed time, God halted the sacrifice, of course, provides a substitute, which gets back to our typology, finished the episode by praising Abraham for his faith and then promised him a multitude of seed, great deal of land, all that. So Abraham's now riding high as he comes home, but he's, come, he's coming home to his wife, the mother of his son without the boy. Ancient Jewish literature talks about all the trepidation she had because she's like, don't take him, don't take him. He says, well, I got to. But no, 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 you can't, don't take my baby. Even though he's, you know, 25 or what have you now. That's, that's just always mama's baby. That's just the way it is. And now he comes back without the boy. And I'm sure he's anxious to tell Sarah all about, look what God has done. Look what God has done. But when he gets home, look at the news he gets. We just read it. He's told of his brother's large family. Guess what? He's got 40, 11 kids. <laughs> Woo! And that was a big deal. That was good back then. Nowadays, maybe, you know, it's hard to feed that many. But, uh, he came home to Sarah with a whopper of a story about a, a promise of many children and land. And then as he's sitting there, and he, I don't know which came first, whether he tells her, listen, Sarah, what happened? And she's probably thinking, I know, because I'm married. Where's my boy? But wait a minute, honey. You just got to understand, where is the boy? What have you done with him? Well, he sent him to college so he could play football, actually. <laughs> But he'll get hurt. Anyway. So he's got all this he wants to share. And then Sarah then tells him, guess what? Your brother has all these kids and children and they got land in a nice house. Not this tent that's flea infested that we keep dragging around the desert. All this sort of stuff. And, and then he's like, bummer, dude, you know. This could have been very disconcerting. He's got a story. Every, we all, male, female, you know how that is. You've got something you can't wait to share and somebody just trumps it. You know. So what were you going to say? Nothing, don't worry about it. I'm going outside of the barn. You know, that sort of thing. Abraham returned home without Isaac, but he also has this reiteration of God's promises. But, he's, but look, here's the problem. He returns home with promises. Look, honey, look, you know what God said? He still has nothing tangible. To show. He doesn't even have his son to show for it anymore. He has literally, as far as what he can put his hands on, 
whatever ground he can scoop up, he has nothing. The relatives up north have everything. And he gets to hear about it. But God told me, well, God's been telling you for 50, 75, well, however many years, a long time now. And so take that as we roll in to Genesis 23. It says, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. <clears throat> so Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Now, I can't imagine losing someone that I'd been with for 100 years. I can't imagine that. I remember when my grandfather on my mother's side died, this man that had essentially helped raise me. I can remember riding on the tractor with him. The first I wound up as a mechanic for years. The first things I ever worked on in my life by myself were his tractor and his truck. And, you know, well, before I was able to go to school or during the summer months, I was there with Papa. And, and that's what we, all over the farm, you know, whatever we were fixing or whatever we were supposed to be fixing, you have to understand, my grandfather was retired and he loved coffee breaks. And so we'd go back out to fix a fence or something and we'd be there like 20 minutes. Well, it's time for coffee break. So you got to load everything back up on the trailer behind the tractor and drive the tractor all the way back to the house. And my grandmother's like, what are y'all doing? It's time for coffee. So we got to take about an hour coffee break. <laughs> and then we go back out. Well, you're not there long before it's time for lunch. <laughs> you know. So that's, that's the way he, he, but he was retired. He could do it by then. But I remember when he passed away, and we hadn't been married too long, uh, when he passed, and I remember my grandmother when we we drove from the hospital in Jackson all the way back to Meridian, and I remember thinking, because they've been married like sixty some odd years, this is the first time in a long time she's going to be in that house alone, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks to have the person you've been next to walking next to. Sleeping next to for 60 some odd years, all of a sudden just removed. And that's what Abraham's going through. Now, this didn't happen right as soon as he got home. I want to say, it was, uh, I, I, I had looked up the chronology, it's probably about maybe 20 years. I, I'm not, I don't exactly remember. It was a few years anyway. But now, a large part of his life is gone. And then at the same time, you've got the char he's got this Charlie uh, Rich tune playing in his head about my elusive dreams. You followed me to Texas. You followed me to Utah. We didn't find it there, so we just moved on. And then went to Alaska because there was a gold mine. But when we got there, there was no gold mine. And they wound up going back to Birmingham. Why, I don't know. But in the song, they go to Birmingham, and then they have a child, and then they wind up, they leave there, but the child doesn't. <coughs> Something happened to the child. And I'm just one of those weird people that everything, lyrics pop in my head. But I'm thinking, he's lived with this woman this whole time, promising, 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 God's promise, God's promise. And he comes like, honey, look what God promised. And never has anything. He has Isaac. But other than that, there's nothing tangible to show for it. And so I can imagine that's running through his head, my poor wife. We were promised land and seed and, and possessing the gates of our enemies. And she passed away and we had one boy. We don't own any land. We own a tent. Lots of them. He's a rich man, but he doesn't own any land. He just moves like a sharecropper kind of. Sarah often gets a bad rap in the Bible because, you know, just curse God. You know, the ha-ha, she's laughing at God. But I want to say this. Sarah is the only woman in the Bible whose age at death is recorded. That says a lot because it's a largely patriarchal society, a patriarchal book. But it gives us some measure of how highly she's regarded in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible are we told to look to Mary, the mother of Jesus, as an example of a godly woman, never told to pray to her. She's not the mother of heaven. That's a pagan identification. She is, 
She, she herself said she was in need of a Savior. So she's not deified in any way. We're never, you know, you're never really given much of a, a picture of, of, of Mary. And, a, you know, she like, come out here, Jesus. She totally misunderstands what's going on. She was a loving mother. But we're never told to follow her example. But twice we're told to look at Sarah as such an example. And I didn't get my notes in on time. But Isaiah 51 verses 1 and 2 and 1 Peter 3 verses 3 through 6. We have Sarah being held up as an example. Because of her faith. And even in, in Hebrews also. So verse 2 says in chapter 23, Sarah died and Kerjeth Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So we see that he comes to mourn for Sarah. And I don't know about here, but where I'm from, there are some people that if you mourn, they think you're not spiritual. Well, that's a home going. That's a big party, you know, and I, I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem when they get on to you because you're actually sad somebody's no longer with you. Someone that's had a large part in your life, that's a big deal. That's a void now. I understand that. But, so, so Abraham is given the opportunity to mourn. And that's part of that's cultural, the way they did it. But here it is. It's a process that God gives us. Because he understands what it's like to lose someone. If you recall... When Jesus was on the cross and he actually, the sin of the world is heaped upon him, everything got dark. And he says, Father, why do you turn from me? What are you looking? Where are you? God can't bear to see his son that way or to look at the sin that's been heaped up on him. So he knows what it's like to miss something, for something to be gone, even if it's for a split second. And so here we go. He goes through the mourning process. But, well, actually, Boyce says that he sets himself, Boyce says that he sets himself deliberately to all the functions of a mourner. How many of y'all watch Downton Abbey? Come on, guys, you can admit it. Not that many? What are, what are y'all watching? Home and Garden TV? Guys, don't let your wives watch that. It creates work for you. It creates expenditures for you. Get rid of that channel. Get her the, the hot rod channel or something. <laughs> but at any rate, when somebody died back then from the late uh, 19th century, even the earlier, early 20th century, and probably back before that, they would wear the all black for a time. Or you see someone wear a, a black armband. That was a cultural thing that just showed they were in mourning. And that's what he's doing right here. So Abraham feels the, his loss of, for Sarah deeply, and he's not afraid to mourn. However, he did not sorrow. If you want to look at 1 Thessalonians 4.13, write that down. He did not sorrow as those without hope. And the Apostle Paul is constantly, one of those things he's talking about is our hope is that this is not the end. You don't just become worm food. You don't go to sleep forever. You certainly aren't reincarnated. You know, if you look at the theology there, all right, this, you've got you to gotta think through your theology. Well, I believe in reincarnation. Not. Because this way reincarnation has to work. Eventually, everything's going to come to equilibrium. And this is how it works. If I murder someone, when I die and I come back, I have to be murdered. Which means somebody has to murder me. Which means they then have to come back and be murdered, which somebody has to murder them. You understand? In that cycle, you never reach this Ah, where everyone is at love and peace. It cannot work. It cannot work. So next somebody, it's time somebody tries to throw that at you, just let them know it doesn't work. But we are not those that have no hope that it's just over with then. We have hope. And Paul talks about that, and that's why he look, uh, uh, always encourages, to, encourages us, as did Jesus, to look for the imminent return. You know, if, it come, if he comes back while we're still here, fine. If we pass away... No biggie, it's a home going. You just kind of change gears from here to something a whole lot better. Says he, uh, that B portion of that verse there in Genesis says that he wept for her. Abraham's mourning was demonstrated in an appropriate way. This man of great faith, the friend of God, wept for the loss of Sarah's companionship. 
nothing at all wrong with that. I don't want to have to go through it myself, but I know that, it, you know, if one of us goes, whichever goes first, well, I don't know if she'll cry if I'm gone, but if she goes, I'm going to be in hot water. I'm going to be in trouble. But to weep for a loved one, Boise once again says, to weep for a loved one is to show that we have been close, that the loss is keenly felt, that death is an enemy, and that sin has brought this sad punishment upon the human race. But it's not the end for us. Verse 3, Then Abraham stood up from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me property for a burial place among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my lord. You are a mighty prince among us, or a sheikh, actually. Bury your dead in the choicest of our burial places. None of us will withhold from you the, uh, his burial place that you may bury your dead. Then Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, the sons of Heth, and he spoke to them, saying, If it is your wish that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and meet with Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is at the end of his field. Let him give it to me at the full price as, prosper, as property for a burial place among you. Now Ephron dwelt among the sons of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the presence of the sons of Heth, all who entered at the gate of the city, which is where they always conduct business, saying, No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field and the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I give it to you, bury your dead. Now, we keep hearing this word give, and we think, oh, it's going to be free. No, the, in Hebrew, the word is, is, is translated give, but the meaning is, you, I'm going to, Abraham's not saying, give it to me for free. He's saying, let me pay you for it. And Ephraim's saying, all right, you, you're going to pay for it. And this is a negotiation that's going on here. So there's not any free stuff being given away here. Then Abraham bowed himself down before the people, verse 12 of the land. He spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If you will give it, please hear me. I will give you money for the field and take it, take it from me and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, My Lord, listen to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. That is several years' pay at that time. What is that between you and me? So bury your dead. And Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham waved out the silver for Ephron, which he had named in the, in the hearing of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, currency of the merchants. So the field of Ephron, here we go, we're, go, we're going, this is a loop, here we go. So the field of Ephron was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was in it, and all the trees that were in the field, which were within all the surrounding borders. There's a reason all of this is, is written this way. Were deeded to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the sons of Heth before all who went into the gate of his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded to Abraham by the sons of Heth as property for a burial place. All right. All right. All he needed was a burial plot. Why does he got to buy a field? And why is it described to the T? All the trees, all the borders? Because he's dealing with local law. And now Heth is one of the sons, uh, is one of the descendants of Heth. His people are the Hittites. However, Hittite kingdoms in modern day Turkey. This is just a bunch of cousins that move south. Okay, so this is not any mighty Hittite empire he's dealing with here. But the Hittite laws say this. If I buy land from you, and this makes sense, you also got to pay the taxes on it. And so Abraham just wants to cave. But you could not sell just the cave. You got to sell the rest of the parcel with it according to Hittite law. Why? So you can pay the tribute or the taxes to the the Hittite or the Canaanite king. So Ephron is a, it's a fair price. He's getting 400 shekels, but he's also getting a big tax write-off. So now Abraham's got to pay the taxes, and that's why it's listed cave, field, all the trees that are in it. It's like a whatever you go down to the courthouse so the government knows exactly how much to charge you and keep charging you and continue charging you and to reevaluate every so many years so they can charge you more. That's what's going on here. So this is not your normal haggling that we would see over there. But I want you to notice this as we finish up. 
Abraham has had nothing tangible other than this one boy. And now, out of all the land he's been promised, he has one grave plot. And that's all he'll ever own. In the entirety of all the promises God made and made again and made again and made again over all those years to him that he has to come home and tell his wife about. And all of this people, his name means, you know, father of all these nations and all this. And you people are going, the guy's only got one kid. Who named this guy? He's, he can be, he could be a laughing stock. And he's talking about, he's telling people about this God he worships, which is different from most of them. They know. We hear that all the time. We know you are a prince. We know God hears you. We know you're a man of Elohim or Yahweh. We know that. But he didn't really have anything to show for it. All he can show them, because he has nothing in this hand, is his character, his faith and his consistency, and how he deals with the the obstacles that are thrown his way. He's still a sojourner in the land. He's still a Bedouin moving around. He He owns nothing other than this one plot. He has grazing rights. He owns a few wells, but he does not have an acre other than this to his name. He shows humility in the buying of the land, even though God, guess what? He could have said, I'm taking this. Why? Because God gave it to me. And, of course, Ephraim's thinking, he didn't say anything to me about it. See my lawyer. He could have walked up and tried that, but no, in his humility. He's not trying to, to hoodoo anybody. It's bad when the church is the one that's always got his hand out. We ought to be the one helping out. That's one reason the government... Has, is, is doing all that it has in giving away everybody else's hard-earned money because the church has abdicated its responsibility to help people. So now the government's taking it over. But here's the problem. That makes people dependent on the government instead of looking to the church and to God for help. Read what Josephus says about that in the Tower of Babel. But anyway, most of us can appreciate the difference between owning property and renting it. It's different. I remember when we first got married, we rented, we had this little trailer, and we rented this little spot, big as this stage or something, to put it on. And when we finally bought, we got, we bought this little place, it was just right across the street. But I remember the feeling, I walked out onto my porch and looked at my grass. I was cutting my grass, not Mr. Bailey's grass, I was cutting my grass. And I could plant tomatoes anywhere I wanted to. I can do whatever I want to because it is mine. You know the difference. Whenever you buy your first, whenever something is yours, it's different. And Abraham, other than this burial plot, does not have this. He's been promised seed numbering as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea, yet he has one son. He's been promised the land of Canaan and then some, but all he has is a cave and a field. In effect, he has a family cemetery plot. And that's it. Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 16 say this, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And when he went out, not knowing where he was going, doesn't have the details, we live on promises, not details. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah, don't give her a bum rap. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. By faith, she did this. And she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, one man, one family. Remember when I told you at the beginning how our decisions affect lots of folks? Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, here we go, not having received the promises. They all passed before they could see the fruition of hardly any of it. But having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. 
Like Larry Norman said, don't ask me, I'm only visiting this planet. You know, it's a good album, buy it. For those who say such things declare plainly, say what things? That speak of the promises of far off, speak of the promises of the word of God. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, meaning Ur, which is not where your Bible map says, it's actually closer to Turkey, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Abraham and Sarah still clung to the promise of God and was counted to them as faith. He would have been nothing other than some obscure nomad had he not believed God. And he's now known as the patriarch of the world's three largest faiths. Faiths. F-A-I-T-H-S, not faiths. Faiths. Okay, my teeth got in the way. But the three uh, monotheistic faiths. And none of us will ever be that famous. But we can still be known to those around us as people of faith clinging to the promises of God despite what others may say or what little we may have to show for it. It wasn't about what Abraham had tangibly. That as you see, all his interactions with the kings around him, people came to him for help. People came to him when they needed a loan. People came to him for protection. People came to him for all sorts of things. Why? He didn't have diddly squat compared to many of the other people around him. But they knew he knew God, even though they worshipped the pagan Canaanite gods, most of them. They knew he was different. And it was his faith that set him apart, not his stuff. And he never really got to put it, other than his son, he never got to put his hands on any of it. So it says that they saw the promises afar off and were assured of them. If they had been thinking about anything else, it says, certain where they came from, they would have wanted to go back. That's where the family is. That's where the family business is. Abraham's father was a rich idol maker before he left town. All that stuff is going on. They had it going on. If they thought about that, but they didn't think about that. They thought forward. They moved forward. Way forward. Now, when it comes to thinking forward, you have generally two different people, types of people. You have the guy that cashes his check on Friday. Unfortunately, he goes to a check cashing place. Instead of the bank, he's going to pay somebody to give him his own money. And then he's going to pay for all his rent to own furniture, stereo system, pay the cash for titles guy, and all that kind of stuff. And by Monday, he's broke again. Doesn't have a pot or a window. To throw the pot out of. (laughs) Doesn't have anything. Has nothing in his, has no retirement. I understand he probably doesn't make the same kind of money, but you can save no matter how little you make. He has nothing. You got other people that think further out and they're constantly stashing it. They got money, whether it's mason jars or 401k or something, even if you're buying savings bonds. They've got people that are stashing back, building interest because they're thinking all those years out and not day to day. And we as Christians are to do like Abraham who didn't have a whole lot, but he was thinking way out, eternity. And that's where we have to place our thoughts. And that's what's going to get you through the roller coaster of you're going to have a kid, not going to have a kid. Don't have it, you know, whatever in Abraham's life. Got to kill the kid now that we finally got the kid. Now we got to, again, we have you... God says he's going to give us all this land and, and, and all this. Honey, we've got to move the tent this week. We're out of grass. Got to move it. I mean, you understand. This is life. I'm just like ours. But in the, in the end, the only thing that kept him going was looking forward. And it was his faith in God because God is faithful. So what, on what are you focusing? That's what I, would ask. We, I want us to all ask ourselves. Are we forward thinking? Are we thinking eternally? Or are we thinking about the car we're going to buy next week or whatever the case may be. Y'all bow your heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Lord God, if we have not been given the exact same promise as Abraham. We have not been promised the Holy Land, the land of Canaan, most of us, and certainly not as individuals. But Lord, we have been promised heaven, and we've been promised eternity spending it with you. And we've been promised that you would be with us throughout all these things. And Lord, I hope that we see that the patriarchs, the apostles, all the characters of the Bible, Ruth, Esther, Sarah, all of these people, None of them had smooth lives. In fact, most of them were persecuted. Many of them died for their faith. And in America, we just think we're supposed to live it up because we're Christians. Or the poorest among us here are better off than most of the people in the rest of the world. Even those that are considered to be in poverty in this country have cell phones and flat screen TVs and air conditioning and that sort of thing, a car. And we still got it oh so bad. But Father, I ask that we will not focus on these daily things in, in this world. I pray that we'll do like Abraham and focus on the will of God and let that steer us through these daily issues. That stumbling blocks become opportunities. Opportunities to see you work. Opportunities for those around us to see you work. Opportunities to make the right decisions not based on our happiness, our circumstance, or our happenstance, but based upon the will of God. And then when we do the hard thing and it still winds up hard, Lord, that we don't blame you because it's not about that outcome. It's about the final outcome. It's about the obedience to you and your will. Not whether it pays off, quote unquote, for us. So Father, I ask that we begin to see things in, the, in an eternal light. And that this that you give us, we're able to share with others. And things such as light the night. That we'll consider sharing it with our children. Not only at home, but plugging in downstairs as we take a more active part in raising our children as well as the children of those around us. Father, you've given us so much. And Father, the, the, there's much to reap. The laborers are few. But Father, if we look at things in, in, in an eternal light, we'll all get busier. But that comes from faith and that becomes fruit, not works. So Father, I ask that you would grow our faith to be like that of Abraham's. He had questions and he had good days and bad days and good months and bad months and even good years and bad years. But no matter what the roller coaster it was as we read through Genesis, by the time we get to Hebrews chapter 11... All we read in so many words is, Well done, my good and faithful servant. And that's what I hope we all hear from the Lord when we get to see Him. So, Father, thank You for all that You've given us. And, Lord, I just pray that we would all heed Your call to whatever it is You would have us do as we become active in Your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.